Good morning, Lighthouse. Come on, everyone, stand to your feet. Let's celebrate. I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. A vagabond. And just when
doesn't he deserve our praise this morning? Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. I'll praise you, Lord. Yes, Lord. There is a king. a king seated among us let every heart receive him now where there is praise he will inhabit and there will be grace and mercy all
Oh, did you come with a praise this morning? For the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. All you can do better than that. Come on, lift up a praise to Jesus this morning. Good morning. Are you ready? Good morning, Lighthouse. Good morning, Beach 95.1. Good morning, YouTube. Come on, Lighthouse. Make all of our first time guests feel right at home this morning. We are glad that you are here. And I got to, the older you get, you got to be careful. Pastor Steve, you see that? I got my little stopwatch going this morning. Because I don't know what happens. The older you get, the more you, the longer you preach. And I'm just like, man, I don't know. If I keep going down the road, I'm in going down. I, we start in the morning and be done about dinner. So don't worry. It's okay. Don't, if, you don't, if you're a first-time guest, don't worry. I will get you out on time this morning, I promise, because we still have to have people working in the nursery next week, all right? Are you, did, have you had a good week? Y'all ain't sure. Are you ready for a great holiday weekend? Happy Labor Day, man. Labor Day. Already. I can't believe it. It's like going to be Christmas before you know it. Wow. Well, hey, uh, last week, if you were with us, we finished a, our whole summer series called By Faith. And we talked about faith, and we preached about faith, and we've been learning how to walk by faith and believe God by faith. And we went, man, we've just been all about some faith this summer. And now we're shifting gears today. We're going to come into our fall uh, series. And today, the series I want to start is called The Ropes. The Ropes. Now, the reason that I'm calling it The Ropes is because we're going to be leaning heavily into the book of Proverbs. We're going to be drawing heavily from Proverbs over the next several months. And I wanted to give you guys a visual, because uh, in this house, we have a whole bunch of unchurched people. And what that means is, that's a good thing, just so you know. We have a whole lot of people who once was lost, but now they're found, was blind, but now they see, you know. We got a bunch of people who ain't been to church, they weren't raised in church, I wasn't raised in church. So they don't know much about the Bible, except for what they've heard over the last few weeks and the last several months, y'all. We have had a whole bunch of people give their hearts and lives to Jesus, man. Go ahead and give him praise for that. That is awesome. So I, Proverbs, when you start reading the book of Proverbs, it really talks a lot about living your life with biblical wisdom. It's all about biblical wisdom. And uh, Proverbs, you know, it sets out to show us the ropes when it comes to just practically living, you know, biblical wisdom in our life. I don't know about you, but I need biblical wisdom every day in my life. Amen. Uh, I'm in a freedom group right now, and I'm, I'm uh, getting to help lead a freedom group. Uh, Tim Sal was nice enough to help, let me help lead, and uh, I'm learning a whole lot in there. But at the end of each freedom group, we pray for one another, and we write down prayer requests for that week. And for the last two weeks that I've been in class, my prayer has been, I need exceptional biblical wisdom. And that's what we're going to really grab a hold of here this morning, and we're going to move forward. And most of you, you know, I know that a lot of people, we've heard the term, you know, the ropes before. Maybe you start a new job and somebody said, hey, come on, I'm going to show you the ropes. Or maybe you start a new hobby and you had to learn the ropes. But where the ropes come from really is from sailors back in the day. And when sailors back in the day, you know, uh, they had to get to know the complicated systems of the sails and the rigging and all that stuff on the old sailing ships back then. And um, if they didn't know the ropes... They weren't going to get anywhere. And if you've ever seen one of those old-timey sailing ships with all the sails, there's just tons of ropes all over the place. And, and, and they had to get to know those. And even by modern standards today, even if they only have one, two, or three, or four sails, there's still a whole lot of ropes, and, and they have to understand what they do. Now, if you're a sailor, or maybe you're in the Navy, or you're in the Coast Guard, come on, we love the military, amen? Come on, under the military. Um, but don't come up and rebuke me at the end of this service because I know the terminology. I know there's halyards and sheets and lines and road, and I understand all that. I'm a sailor too, I know. But I'm just using the word rope uh, in this series because I don't want to get caught in the weeds on all that stuff. I just want to give people biblical guidance, and I want us all to have a, a word picture we can all associate with so that we can all learn the ropes together. Amen? So now... Um, if you know me at all, then you know it's no accident that I'm using the terminology of the ropes because I kind of have a slight obsession with sailing. 
all right, I've got a confession, pastoral confession. <laughs> uh, we started sailing about three years ago, me and Kinsley, my youngest, and we've had a ball sailing. Now, about, gosh, I watch YouTube videos about sailing. I read books about sailing, and, and I've really had a good time uh, learning those things with her. And probably about a year ago, we almost bought a sailboat. Uh, but then Julie stepped in and said no. And I said, well, come on, babe. And, and I'm like, come on, we, we, this would be really a great opportunity. Let's get this sailboat. And, you know, Julie had a, not an irrational fear. You have to know the difference in an irrational fear and a rational fear. She was concerned that I wouldn't get to know the ropes good enough. And she was concerned that her husband would end up in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. All right. Now, considering the budget that I had to work with and the vessel that I was looking at, looking back, I know that was wisdom. <laughs> Praise God. Because I would have most likely have died, you know, uh, somewhere along the way. But anyway, I, I don't want to get too far down that road. But, you know, Julie uh, and I, we were talking about it whenever we first started uh, talking about doing the sailing thing. And uh, are there any people that just kind of go, you just, when you're in it, you're in it. You know what I'm saying? You're like, if you're into motorcycles, you're into motorcycles. If, if you're into, you know, uh, cars, you're into cars, that kind of a thing. You're into sports, I can't talk to you. And, uh, <laughs> but when we got into sailing, I started thinking about it. I was like, how cool would it be to get on a sailboat in Panama City, jump on that thing, head down the Gulf of Mexico, go around the corner at Key West, cut across the Gulf Stream, head over and sail the Bahamas for a few weeks. How many of y'all would jump in on that trip? <laughs> Yeah, okay, so you're with me. See, that's vision, right? I'm like, yeah, we can go do that. See, I don't do anything little. I don't just think about doing things, you know, the little way. But, but see, the problem is if you don't know the ropes, there ain't no telling where you're going to end up. I mean, at best, you'll end up kind of just drifting around, not really getting anywhere. But at worst, you'll end up shipwrecked or sunk somewhere. And see, I know some of y'all are still thinking that I'm talking about me and talking about a sailboat, but I want you to hear me with spiritual ears this morning. If you don't know the ropes, you'll be blown around. You'll be at the mercy of the wind in your life. You'll be blown around by everything that the news says. You'll be blown around by everything that Facebook says. You'll be blown around by, by the opinions of your friends and the people around you. You'll be blown around. The Bible talks about every wind of doctrine. You'll be blown around by these things. See, that's why it's important that you know the ropes. Because on a sailboat, the ropes do a couple of very important things. See, the ropes adjust the sails so that you can leverage or harness the wind. Hear me with spiritual ears this morning. What I'm talking about is anybody ever been in a situation in your life whenever you're doing the best you can and you're working as hard as you can and you're running as fast as you can and every time you get a, a little bit ahead, you get blown back. Anybody been there? Anybody feel like you just run against the same problem over and over and over again just to get blown back? Anybody been there? I've been there plenty of times. See, this is why you have to know the ropes. Because the very same wind that's blowing against and beating against your life, when you know the Word of God and you know the wisdom of God and you know the ropes, you can make adjustments in your life. And as you make those adjustments, the very thing that was pushing you back, you can harness to propel you forward where God designed you to go. Oh, yeah. We're going to go there and we're going to learn some things in this series. Because, you know what? When you adjust the ropes in your life, just like on a sailboat, that's the only way you can intentionally get where you're supposed to be. We're going to talk a little bit, a little bit about setting headings too. See, the problem most of us have, have is that we think we're the captain. He's the captain. We need to take the position of the deckhand. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. See, the captain sets the course. The captain sets the heading of your life. But see, what we're, our job is, our job is to grab a hold of the ropes and do what he says to do and make the adjustments so that our vessel ends up where it's supposed to be. Regardless of what you walk through, regardless of what you sail through, regardless of what your marriage might be going through right now, or what your kids might be going through right now, or what your health might be going through right now, or what it is that keeps trying to trip you up. See, there's godly wisdom in this book. And you can learn these ropes I'm talking about, and you won't have to keep making the same mistake over and over and over again. You can use the ropes, you can use the Word of God to grab the wisdom of God to change your life forever. 
I'll tell you something else it's used for. It's for anchoring. You better have a rope tied to that anchor. And you better have that anchor tied to the boat. Come on now, how many of y'all ever had a rope tied to the anchor through the anchor and didn't tie it to the boat? <laughs> Love your honesty, sir. Anybody else ever done that? Donovan, I feel you, bro. I feel you. Man, I had to do that one time. Is Brian in here? Where's Brian at? No? I don't know if Brian was with Brian, you here? He's up here. I, I forget. It was, is that Brian Robinson up there? Yeah. I, it was one of us. I don't remember who it was. And it was, thank God, we had scuba gear with us because we were out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and, and threw the anchor in and kept going. But see, in life, in life, man, you got to have that rope tied to that anchor because storms are going to come. And when storms come, you better, you better take that little sailboat you got, the little life that you got. You better find your place to be in shelter. You got to find shelter in time of a storm. And that's why you got to have that rope. You got to have that wisdom, the biblical wisdom and knowledge because storms are going to come. It's not if the wind blows, it's when the wind blows and how hard the wind blows. And whenever things begin to blow up around your life, you've got to find that you find yourself up underneath the shadow of the Almighty and you go and you put down that rope, you put down that anchor. See, I don't want to set my anchor on shifting sands. No, no, no. I want to build my life on the rock of God's word and I want to have him and his wisdom making the decisions as I move along in my life. So you got to find yourself in a place where you're sheltered from the storm. That's the problem. Too many people don't know where to run to. People keep running to the stuff of their past instead of running to the God of their future. Tell you something else. You better learn how to tie things down. It's been years ago now. Oh, my gosh. We were in California still. That was about seven or 8,000 years ago. We were moving in the military. And Julie, <laughs> Julie had this glass table with chairs for outside. You know, uh, with the umbrella thing in it. You know, uh, patio furniture. That's what it's called. Thank God I don't speak for a living. And I set that patio furniture up in the back of my truck. And Julie said, hey, babe, you better tie that down. And I was like, it ain't going nowhere. <laughs> you already know. I'm going to tell you anyway, but you already know. I'm going down the interstate in California, you know, roughly some miles an hour. I don't know. <laughs> and I just happened to look up in my rearview mirror when I hit about 80. And the table shaking like this. And it's a big old glass table, y'all, shaking like this. And it levitated. And then it went... <laughs> And then I saw something wild happen. This thing flies backwards and cars start going all over and it hits the ground. It looked like rain. It was beautiful <laughs> when the glass flew across and the chairs were flying. And then you know what I did? I did what you would have done. I downshifted and punched it. I kept going. <laughs> I was barely saved. <laughs> See, in life, you got to keep things tied down. Because when rough times come, when storms come, when, when you accelerate, <laughs> things you need and things you value, if, you're, if you don't tie them down correctly in your life with biblical wisdom, you'll lose things that are important to you along the way. If you don't make decisions based on biblical wisdom in your marriage, you're going to lose things that are precious with you along the way. If you don't parent with biblical wisdom, you might lose some things that are precious to you along the way. If you don't regard the Word of God in areas of your health and different things, you could lose something very precious to you along the way. I'm still in my introductions. You're going to have to pray for me. I told you. But see, here's the problem. Our tendency in life is to think that the ropes are insignificant. Come on, man. You're going to preach about Old Testament? What? Proverbs? Is this the best you can do? Come on, man. Preach about something exciting. Come on, we want to shout. You know, I, I want you to shout. But I want you to shout when you win. And you ain't going to win if you don't have biblical wisdom operating in your life. I'm all about shouting. I'm all about praising. I will praise. My gosh, I'll praise. Because I know the one who's worthy of my praise. I don't come here to tolerate God. I come here to celebrate God. But see, it can't be something that you just do on Sunday morning. We need to celebrate Him throughout the week, right? 
24-7, 365, operating in biblical wisdom. If you want your business to turn around, if you want these things to turn around in your life, if you want your attitude to turn around, we have to start learning the ropes according to the word of God. But we think they're insignificant. We don't want to be bothered by the ropes, man. Come on, they're a hassle. They're, we're so enamored. With the things we have going on. I'm going to keep using the sailing analogy. We, we, we're, we get so enamored with the sailboat or the water or the sunsets. And we tend to romanticize everything. And, and we think, oh, he, who needs to learn all that? Who needs to pay attention to the ropes? They're just ropes. But the writer of Proverbs said, you better learn the ropes, son. You better learn some biblical wisdom. You better learn some godly wisdom in your life. And, and I'm going to go ahead and say this because we have a lot of people in here that's a lot smarter than me. If you already know the ropes, you better stay engaged. You better stay focused on the ropes. See, you don't just set it and forget it. This ain't the, uh, the Ronco rotisserie oven that you bought on the infomercial. Come on, how many of y'all remember that thing? You know, he's, oh, you take the chicken and you put the chicken in there and you put the thing in the thing and you shut it down and you turn it on and you set it and forget it. You saw the infomercial. Life don't work that way. Biblical wisdom doesn't work that way. You got to know the ropes, man. Because these ropes I'm talking about have to be maintained in your life. They have to be adjusted in your life. they got to be consistently adjusted and observed in light of the environment that you find yourself in. You're going to find yourself in good places. You're going to find yourself in bad places. You're going to find yourself in all kinds of different places as you go through life. So what do you do? You have to keep adjusting the biblical wisdom in your life to meet the situation you find yourself in. You've got to keep adjusting the rope. One of the major themes here is this biblical wisdom. So we're going to start today, and we're going to look at biblical wisdom on on, on a whole bunch of stuff through the series. We're going to look at friendships and dating and marriage and parenting and all kinds of stuff. But the stuff that we're going to talk about, it's important. It's important. Some of you know this stuff. This is nothing new. I have said, I've preached this kind of thing many times, and you know why I'm still preaching it? I'll tell you why. Because most of us are selfish when it comes to relationships, and we have amnesia from the things we've heard that we don't want to do. We tend to forget the ropes when it comes to stuff that we want, you know? However much we think that we know, however much I think I know, the reality of relationships is that they must... We must commit to doing what we know. It's not just knowing it. We have to commit to doing it. It's one thing to be able to regurgitate what the Bible says. It's another thing to live out what the Bible says. Now, some of y'all, y'all are brand new, and you don't know the ropes to begin with. You don't know, you don't know the first thing about it. That's okay, because we're going to help you learn. And some of y'all just jumped in your little sailboat and, uh, you know, 10 years ago threw up the sails and you just went wherever the wind blew you and it was an adventure and you're like, woo, I'm just going to party and do my thing. And now here you are 10 years later and you look back on your life and you see a wake of broken relationships and a wake of pain that's been left back there and you don't like where you've ended up. Well, that's okay because we're going to help you make adjustments now using biblical wisdom so that you change that course that you've plotted for yourself. Then we're going to show you how to take the word of God and allow God to come in and become the captain of your vessel. That's what we're all about over the next several months. I want to jump into Proverbs 1.1. 1, 1. The Bible says, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king, the king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction and prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, and knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. I love the fact here that he doesn't let anybody off the hook. He says, if you're simple, that's okay, you can learn. If you're wise, that's okay, you can add to your learning. Verse 6, he says, for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and the, and the riddles of the wise. Verse 7, the fear of the Lord. I want to stop right there on the word fear. The fear of the Lord here, that is a profound reverence or a profound respect or an incredible awe of God. So the fear of of the Lord, that is the respect of the Lord. You respect Him. It's a big, big, big deal. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Look, fools ignore the ropes, y'all. They ignore biblical wisdom. And, And biblical wisdom 
starts right here in verse number 7. It says it starts with the fear of the Lord. An immense respect for God. An immense respect for His ways. We're coming to the Lord saying, Lord, I, I, I can't figure out all your mysteries. I can't because you're bigger than me. You're smarter than me. And you're, you're way, way more than I am. But, but you know what? I'm going to make a choice in my life. I'm going to acknowledge your greatness. And I'm going to learn from your biblical wisdom. I'm going to learn the ropes so that I can follow after you all of the days of my life. And just so you know, too, there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. And I've done this on and off over the years. Is I, I, What I like to do is I like to read a proverb a day. Today is the fourth, so today you would just read Proverbs chapter 4. Tomorrow is the fifth. You get it. Read that tomorrow. And I'm going to challenge every one of you. Everybody listening on Beach 95.1, those watching on YouTube, everyone in the house, I'm going to challenge everybody. If you already have a Bible reading pro a program you're doing, do it. Add a proverb to it. If you don't read anything right now, start reading the book of Proverbs with us every single day because we want you to gain godly wisdom. Amen? You know why I read it? Because it helps me to avoid foolish behavior. Anybody else need to avoid foolish behavior? Amen. Father, we ask you to help us for the next few minutes to grab this word, apply it to our life. Lord, help in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. that was my introduction. 20 minutes and 48 seconds. <laughs> Y'all nervous. Don't be nervous. It's cool. Today we're going to tackle something called friendship. Every time I preach on friendship, I think that you think that this is kindergarten material. Every time I preach on it, I'm like, man, they're going to think this is dumb. You know, why, why are you preaching on friendship? We're not in kindergarten. Come on, preach faith, preach power, preach miracles, preach healing, preach, preach David and Goliath or the walls of Jericho again. Give me something I can shout about. But here's the thing. If you look around today, we are not... We don't know how to be good, godly, biblical friends. We need to know how to be godly friends, y'all. Look, look, look. If you can't be a godly friend, then you can't be a godly husband or wife. If you can't be a godly friend, then you can't, be, you, you can't steward singleness well. If you can't be a godly friend, then you can't be a godly parent. You can't be a godly leader. If you can't be a godly friend... You can't reflect Jesus well, and we want to reflect Jesus well. Amen? See, godly friendship is the foundation of all these things that I'm talking about. And here's the thing. Friendship is God's idea. I've heard it said it this way. I've heard it said that the first problem in the world was not sin. It was solitude. Wait, what? Yeah, the first problem wasn't sin. It was solitude. If you go back and you look when God created everything, he created the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the, the, the animals, the, the, the plants. He created everything. And when he created it all, he looked and the Bible says when he saw it, he said it was good. He created it. It was good. Then God created Adam. And after God created Adam, he looked at Adam and he saw a problem. In Genesis chapter 2, 18, the Bible says, God says, it is not good for a man to be what? First problem was not sin, it was solitude. It is not good when you're alone. Y'all, we got like 800 people in small groups. We got, we got people all over the place. We got every possible way to try to get you connected. We got small groups. We got freedom groups. We got a kayak small group. We got a singles group. We got a young adult group. Why do we have all these groups just so we can do more stuff? No, because it is not good for you to be alone. You need godly friendships in your life. Not just friendships. You need godly friendships in your life. But for you to know what a godly friend is, you have to know the ropes and you have to be operating by biblical wisdom in your life. Not just because of storms, but in the good times and in the bad times. You need to know who to let in. You have to know. See, Adam... That happened before the fall, y'all. This was before sin had entered the world. Adam, you know, he needed community. He needed people around his life. See, for a while, Adam, Eve, and Adam, Eve, and God, they all hung out in community, and everything was great. But then sin fractured that relationship. But thanks be to God, God loved us so much, he sent Jesus to restore that broken, fractured relationship so that we don't have to hide from God or from each other. Because that's what they were doing in the garden after the fall. They were hiding from each other and hiding from God. Everybody's hiding. That's not how God wants us to be. No. 
He said, hey, we're going to fix this. We're going to fix this. So he sent Jesus and he made a way once again for us to enjoy the friendship between each other and with God. See, God wants to restore true friendship to the church and he wants the church to restore true friendship with the world. That does not mean that we go out and we act like the world and talk like the world and we do, no, no, no. It means that we go out and we be the light in a dark place and that we operate with a different set of rules and we operate with wisdom that they don't have and we operate with faith that they don't have so that whenever they see us go through things, whenever they see us go through problems, we don't have to fall apart because greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world and that I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be anxious. I don't have to be depressed. I don't have to do those things. Why? Because God said, I am his. And then they look and they say, what's different about you? Oh, what well, did you read some special book? As a matter of fact, I did. Yeah. How come you aren't doing what everybody else is doing? How come you're not struggling with what everybody else is struggling with? Oh, it's because I don't have to play by your rules. Everybody's all stirred up about what's in the news. Everyone's all stirred up over politics. Everyone's all stressed out about this, that, and the other thing. I'm not saying not to care. I care. But you know what? I don't live by that mess. I live by the Word of God. This government is not my God. No, 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 no. No. What Facebook says about me is not my God. What YouTube has to say is not my God. Of course, it would all be great if I read it. Because everybody loves me. And if you don't, don't tell me. Don't bust my bubble. We're 26 minutes deep. You good? All right. Study after study reveals that people are lonely. More lonely than ever. That doesn't even make sense to me. I got a cell phone sitting right here. I can call anybody I want to 24-7, 365 around the world. Doesn't matter what time zone. Doesn't matter. But see, people are more disconnected and more lonely studies show than ever before. And it's mind-boggling to me with the access that we have to people. It makes no sense. But see, the problem is, is that we've traded, we've traded embodied, godly, face-to-face, -face, messy relationships for friendships on the internet. Oh, yeah. Friendships are messy, right? So, so people, instead of going through the process, instead of, instead of being a, a godly friend, people, we've, 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 we've changed it, man. We've, we've changed it to uh, internet relationships that we can manipulate. Now, I'm not saying there's no true friendships to be found, you know, online. I'm not saying that. I would never say that. I'm just saying it would be very difficult to find true, lasting friendship like what I'm talking about. Because online... We can, what can we do? We can delete, we can add, we can hide, we can edit, we can filter to our heart's content. We can create a world that's not even real and we can live in it as though it is. See, God does not have to bless who you say you are. Amen? No. See, look, look, look. O online... People, they, they, they can do anything they want to do. They can act like anyone they want to act like. They can speak their mind without accountability. They, they can be keyboard warriors, man. You know, we're bombarded with the issues of thousands, and we wonder why we don't have the energy to love our neighbor who's right in our face. Man, not only that, but we've given over to this mentality that quantity is better than quality. Y'all, I said it before, and I'll say it again. You do not have a thousand friends. I checked, I checked my Facebook this morning. I have 4,074 friends. I have news for you. I do not have 4,000 friends. I don't have 74 friends. Not real friends. Not the friends I'm talking about. No, 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 no. This, men, this mass mentality is foolish. People getting their, their, their self-esteem by social media likes and by how many people follow them and by how many people comment on my witty little post. Oh, and if you don't repost this, then you don't love me. Oh, my gosh. Well, if you were really a true friend, you would repost this to, your, to three more friends. It's like, shut up. Nobody wants to repost that junk. No. Go ahead. Why is it everybody claps, but before I get home, ten people will do it? Yay. Hold on. Hey, you've got to forward this or I'm not going to have good luck for the next ten years. What is going on? 
Proverbs, here we go. Proverbs 18, uh, 24. The Bible says, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Hear me this morning. Everyone cannot and everyone should not be a close friend of yours. There's two types of people out there typically. And we want to come against both these types. Number one is the person who wants no friends. They, I'm going to go it alone. I'm going to do it by myself. That's someone who doesn't want any accountability. They just want to be able to do what they want to do and be what they want to be. And just kind of, you know, everyone, they just push everybody out. And then you have the other kind of person who they want to make sure a thousand people love them. They, they have to have everybody's approval. One is going to leave you isolated. The other one is going to leave you an anxious mess. Because over here, you're going to be bitter and lonely and all that. And you got, you know, you got nobody, you know, no close friends. And over here, you got somebody who's just falling apart because they're trying to keep up on all these people who really ain't close friends to begin with. Neither example of these extremes is godly friendship like what I'm talking about here. No, man. You know, what, you know if, 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 if we've ever needed godly wisdom regarding friendship, it's right now. Look, man, I, I, want you to, I want you to keep a couple of things in mind as we jump through this and wrap it up this morning. Is this. We want to be godly friends and we want to have godly friendships. Amen? But as I'm preaching this, keep this in mind. I am not telling you for you to start looking at your friends and say, you know what? You guys stink. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't start looking at your friends and say, well, you're not a godly friend and you're this and you're that and start pointing your fingers. No, no, no. Hold off on that, okay? And you focus on being a godly friend. If you say, well, I don't have any godly friends, you go be a godly friend. I read somewhere where, where, where it said, that, that which you sow, you shall also reap. So if you want to reap godly friends, you have to become one. Become a godly friend to somebody else. You know, the other thing is, is if, you're, if you're married here, if you're a couple, keep in mind that friendship is the minimum in marriage. That's the minimum. I think we'll get into the rest of it. Take these, take these moments, these next few Sundays, and check yourself. Check yourself. Check your heart. You know, a good and godly marriage, it won't just happen without you being good and godly, having friendship as the foundation. And, and I can't go into all the nuances of, of marriage this morning and all that, but Proverbs, it does give us the ropes and we're going we're gonna to learn two ropes this morning really quick before we go. We have to learn the rope of respect. Everyone please say respect. We have to learn that rope, y'all. Remember, we just read that the beginning of knowledge is a massive respect for God. And, and you know, interestingly enough, friendships also require respect. Not on the God level, of course, but we need to be people who respect God and who respect others. If we're going to have successful, godly friendships, we have to be people who respect people. And one of the main ways that we show respect is the way that we talk about our friends, especially when they're not in the room. Hello? I wish the church had this part down. I wish that every time somebody left the room, I wish that everybody was speaking well of each other and there wasn't any gossip going around and that every time I left a place or left a room or whatever, everything that everybody had to say was good. I, I wish that were the case. I, you know, if we could actually get that part down where the church quit gossiping and we all started actually speaking well of one another, it would revolutionize the, not only our lives and the church, it would probably revolutionize the city. Because we're not acting like them, talking like them, being like them. No, they can see a distinct difference between us and them. They're like, man, I don't know what it is about you. But I always feel good when I'm around you. Yeah, that's the Holy Spirit. Those are people who need godly friends. Pull them people in. Be a godly friend to them. You'll lead them to Jesus and he'll set them free. Proverbs 11 says it this way. It says, whoever derides their neighbor, that word means ridicules. Whoever ridicules their neighbor has no sense. But the one who has understanding shuts up. Oh, is that what it says? <laughs> whoever derides, whoever ridicules their neighbor has no sense. But the one who has understanding holds their tongue. Is it okay if I say shut up? I mean, I ain't talking, I ain't telling you to shut up. I'm just saying, I'm saying, I got to shut up. 
Verse 13, a gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy person keeps a secret. Be a res- if you want friends, God be friends, be a respectful friend. Be a friend that cultivates honor in your relationships. Be a friend that is trustworthy. Oh, and if you're a gossip, don't expect to ever have any real friends. Because every time you start to get one, you'll run your mouth and you'll run them off. Is that too clear? I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get to the point. Because I'm going to get to lunch because I'm getting hungry. Somewhere along the line, we picked up this little phrase, and I love it. I don't know who wrote it. Somebody wrote it. It's a quote from somewhere. I did not write it. I am not that smart. But this is the quote. It said, if something is of a sensitive nature and you are not part of the problem or part of the solution, this is probably a conversation you don't need to be having. Can I read that one more time? As the worship team comes on back. If something is of a sensitive nature and you're not part of the problem or part of the solution, this is probably a conversation that you don't need to be having. Paul was talking about in the book of Romans, he was talking about what it looked like to be a Christian. This is part of it. Romans 12, 10, he says, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. You know, of all the ways that we compete with one another, I don't see this one very often, where people compete in showing honor. I think that's a cool way to compete, man. And I'm not, it, that's not flattery. It's about seeing godly qualities in your brothers and sisters in Christ around you and honoring them for that. When you see a man of God, be a man of God, honor him for that. Whenever you see a woman of God, be a godly mother or a godly wife, honor her for that. Or if they're serving and they're serving my, the other night, I honored uh, Missy and Johnny and the whole bunch that was out there on Friday night. I don't know how many folks that, that we fed that night, but there was a whole bunch of them out there that got fried fish because, but who was oh, who was it? Oh, Andy. Andy fried that fish. I bet you probably still smell like fish. (laughs) People came out to make sure that people who didn't have a hot meal had a hot meal. I honor that. And there was, God, there was Lighthouse t-shirts everywhere. There was so many people out there. It was like you could hardly drive down Mound Avenue because you were going to get invited to eat. Now, (laughs) they were stopping cars. Coming down Mount Avenue. I had to turn around and walk away because they're like this. Good morning. Hey. <laughs> they're stopping cars. And I was like, that person almost didn't stop. That's walking by faith, I guess. Respect those, man. It also involves giving honor where honor is due. My last one, as I close, is loyalty. Y'all, we need to be loyal friends, not fair weather friends. This week, I had some friends of mine flew in from, uh, one flew in from Tennessee and one flew in from uh, Missouri, St. Louis. And some of the best relationships I've ever had, the friendships that I've ever had, was formed in times of adversity. These two dudes, I haven't seen them in 25 years. It was like we picked up from the day that we left off. The reason that we have that bond is because we served many deployments together overseas in some really crappy situations. Some of the crappiest situations I have ever walked through is how I've established some of the best friends that I've got. That's who you can tell who's loyal. Proverbs 17, 17, and I'll close with this one. It says, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. There's people in this room right now that's been with me for over 20 years. There's people in this room been with me for over 10, 15 years. I'm so thankful for the godly friendships that I have, but listen to me. That doesn't happen overnight, and it didn't happen because I pushed people away. You have to let people in. I know some of y'all looking around your life, and you're like, well, I don't have any good godly friends. Okay? Simple. Simple. Invite someone to coffee this week. Invite someone to dinner. Join a small group. I told you, we've got tons of them. Get, serve. You get on a serve team here, you're going to meet lots of people. Put yourself out there, man. And, and the last time I did this, I had like 50 people invite me to coffee. I can't, there's not enough time. I'm already a nervous wreck, much less having that much coffee. Find people. Find your people. 
Find your people. Go ahead and stand with me this morning. We're going to learn the ropes so we can make those decisions based on godly wisdom and not based on the junk that we've always done. Amen? But see, it don't matter if you come into this building or listen to me on Beach 95.1 or watch me on YouTube. You can sit here in the building for week after week after week. You can go to church and not be a Christ follower. This will do you no good. If you come here and just learn how to be a good person. We're not here to teach you how to be a good person. We're here to help you to have a real, living, breathing relationship with Jesus. And then from the love of Jesus, you will have, He will fill you with love. And then from the overflow of love in your life, you'll be able to love godly friends with the godly love of God. Godly love of the God. Yeah, you get it. It has to start with Him. It has to start with Him. We're not here to play a game today. I'm going to pray with you right now. And I'm going to ask you for just a second, everybody, to bow their heads real quick. Everything I said was great, but this is the most important. I don't care where you've been, how good you think you are, how bad you think you are. I don't care what you've done. Ask yourself this question right now. Have I given Jesus my whole heart? And am I living for him every day? Super simple. Two questions. Have you given Jesus your whole heart? Are you living for him every day? If you're not, and if you haven't, I want to pray with you right now. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to know who I'm praying with. If that's you, lift your hand. I'm going to start on this side over here with the, uh, on the stadium over here. If your hand is up, just you. I want you to look me in my eyes. God bless you and you and you. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Yeah. On the floor, I'm going to look across the floor. Welcome home, sir. Welcome home, ma'am. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Yeah. Welcome home. Welcome home. Yeah. And this side over here, anybody over here, if that's you. I don't want to, I see, welcome home, sir, welcome home. Over here, I'm looking in the balcony, Anybody, I see you up there, both of you up there. Anybody else in the balcony, say, that's me. I see your hand, welcome home. If I saw your hand, that's great. If I don't see your hand, hey, Beach 95.1, YouTube, pray with me right now. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I've committed sin. And I ask you today to forgive me of all my mess, all my past. I give it all to you. And from this day forward, you are mine, and I am yours. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. And I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hold on one second. Hold on. Because they have a song. This is how we do it. It's 1138. We're in good shape. What we're going to do, we're going to sing one song. It's four minutes long. And then we're going to dismiss you. But it's in this moment that the Holy Spirit wants to touch your life. I need my section leaders to come out and get ready. During this song, if you need prayer for healing, if you need prayer for deliverance, if you need encouragement, if you need whatever you need, whatever the Holy Spirit was dealing with your heart, don't be prideful. We're family here. It's Lighthouse fam, man. You're, you're going through something? Tell somebody. Don't go through it alone. Find one of these awesome folks up here, man. Come up and just say, hey, I just need you to pray for me. I'm going through a mess right now. This is a place where you can take off the religious mask and you can be real. So if you need prayer today, go ahead and get out of your seats. We're going to sing this one song. Then we will dismiss together as a family. Go ahead, worship team. Do your thing.
celebrate what an amazing gift his life is to us and I'm gonna try to say that without crying because I have been his friend for 19 years and he has stood by me and my husband for a very long time when we were knuckleheads so I am very thankful and I want us to just as a staff we want to take this opportunity to just honor him and love him and what a better way to do that than to fill this house with his favorite people and that is you that is you so if you could do us a favor and help us plan for that go on the church center app it's up there you don't even really have to scan the qr code anymore we put it up he knows not to look we're keeping the details a secret but it's going to be such a fun night but we need your help to plan so if you could go register and get your name signed on there so we know that you're coming and we can start filling all the seats that would be fantastic i've had a few people ask me about what are we doing for pastor appreciation in october this is what we're doing we're going to appreciate and love him and honor him um, with just coming together and celebrating him for a really fun night remember that those details are a secret for him so don't come up and say hey do you know mm, don't do that okay so <laughs> share secrets among yourself but remember it's between us if you are a first-time guest today he would love to say hi to you and say welcome home and answer any questions you have he's gonna be under the exit sign over here this morning he'd love to shake your hand and get to know you um, if you got saved this morning if you raised your hand and said that prayer with pastor Cole for the very first time welcome home welcome to the family of God we're so excited please get out your cell phone and text the word saved to the number 850-266-7667 and that's if you're on YouTube or the radio however you were saved this morning whatever technology whether you're in the building or not we want you to connect with us so please text in those words if you're brand new text the word new we want to connect with you if you need prayer for anything the easiest way to give is to text the word give to that number or download the church center app the church center app will get you connected to everything going on here so we're just so happy that you're here every single week we love seeing your smiling faces so let's pray and get out of here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for just your anointing and your presence this morning with us, just each week that you show up and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. See you next week. <laughs>